Welcome everyone to episode number 97 of Underserved. With me in studio today is Komal Maliekal, Director of Engineering at Athena Health. Let's get started. Welcome to this week's edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry, where we focus on stories of tech industry leaders, their insights, and their lessons learned. And now, your host, Andrew Jelina. Como, thank you so much for joining us today on Underserve. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. I'm so glad to be here. This is one of my first podcast recordings. So yeah, a little nervous. <laughs> nah, you'll be fine and we're glad to have you. So you've been a logical person all your life. What kind of sparked your interest in technology? So I've, yes, you said it right. I've been a logical person all my life and I've always been a problem solver. You know, like if I see a problem, I'm always not one of those guys who will get bogged down by it. But I'm like, how do we solve this? Let's get down and let's just figure out how to solve this. So if I have to like think of a really specific incident, I would say it was in 10th grade. One of our computer science teacher said that I'm going to do a class in summer vacation for a couple of students and I'm going to teach you coding. And I was like, why not? Let's give it a shot because, you know, it's summer vacation. What else are you going to do? So I went for that class and that's when I wrote my first C program. It was a program for a simple calculator. And that just piqued my interest. You know, I was like, wow, you know, how do you convert logic to really something working? You know, it was it was cool. So my daughter's taking her first class and they're making her learn in C and it just seems like such a hard way to start. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. You know, I feel developers today have it easy. Like we had to take care of everything. We didn't have any kind of IDEs. You know, we had function pointers, malex and garbage collection, dispose, everything. Like we had to think of the program from start to end. There was no help. You know, yeah, there was, was no Google. If you malloc, you must free. Yeah. Like, what are you using for an editor? Are you Emacs or VI? I think we used VAI. Yeah. 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 Wow. Those days. <laughs> <laughs> so that piques your interest. Do you end up going to school for a similar field? I was always a practical person, not a very theoretical person. So even in school, I liked, you know, going to my chemistry lab, my physics lab, rather than just, you know, reading books about it. And I was more of a physics, chemistry, maths kind of a person, not biology. I hated biology. So... <laughs> You know, in uh, Bangalore, there are 100 plus engineering colleges in the city limit. A hundred engineering colleges yeah. within city limit. Yes. And I think I checked the numbers last. It's 109. Wow. Just in a city. So which one do you end up going to? I went to a college called Dr. Ambedkar Institute of Technology. It's a deemed university now, but at that point it was affiliated to a university called Vishweshwarya University. So... I remember, you know, they used to have an entrance exam. You know, students would write a biological exam and also a physics, chemistry, maths kind of example. I didn't even write bio because I just hated the subject. I threw the books after my last exam saying, I knew I'm not going down that route. So I wrote my exam with, I think, 400,000 students. I scored well. I was in the top 1%. So I got into a good college and then I picked up my major into information science. And so you're learning some programming. What language are you learning in college? I don't know if it, even if it exists today. Like we were taught COBOL. Oh, it exists. <laughs> it does? Oh, okay. yeah. I'm surprised. We are. <laughs> so we learned COBOL. But I think it was all about toughing you up. You know, you're making you strong or making you learn fast. You know, how do you get through 64 subjects in 48 months? Or maybe, you know, if you take out the breaks and all this stuff, it's I think 44 months. So how do you learn fast? How do you keep up with this ever-changing technological world? That's the part they taught us. They taught us logical design. They taught us algorithm. They taught us system design. It was not more about, you know, languages, but it was more about learning how to think logically, learning how to think step by step and building that algorithm. But you told me during the pre-call that they also had a bunch of like prerequisites that everybody had to take. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think the first year of engineering, at least in India, irrespective of which major you have selected, all the students go through a common set of subjects, which is basically to make sure that you think of engineering from all aspects, not just from computers. So we had subjects like welding, carpentry, machine designing, and all that stuff. Wow. So, you know, imagine going to a lab and just chipping away at wood and trying to make a box or doing welding. So yeah, that was interesting. And it really made us think of design in a very different aspect. What was it like being a woman in STEM with this sort of environment? As you can imagine, these labs were not designed for women. 
especially when you're doing welding, you have to be careful about safety, security. Uh, you do get hurt. You can get chipped at things, you know, when you're working with carpentry. You know, we've been brought up because of the social conditioning, you know, the way social conditioning kind of gets into our policies, our way of thinking and how it impacts the environment, you know. For example, there were these lab assistants in our workshops who would just assume that these classes would be not preferred by girls or they wouldn't like doing it. And they would just think that we need more help and even lower the bar for us. And there have been many times where they overtake the project. Like I'm doing a welding project and some lab assistant will say, forget it, I'll do it for you. You know, just it's OK, which I didn't like that. I was a fighter spirit and I was like, what the hell? I'm going to do it. I'm going to make the best carpentry box or wooden box or whatever it is with my own skills and with my own hands. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have the course here for me to learn. Let me learn. Like yeah. you, you don't need to nerf it for me. Yeah. So And they knew because we were not majors of that subject. So they knew we are just not going to do it for all four years of engineering. So yeah. All the more reason to let you try it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So towards the end of school, like what's the process for finding your first job out of school? Oh, yes. That was the cool part of college life where all these tech companies would come to campuses to recruit interns and they would give us presentations and then we would have tests. We would have group discussions and we'll be in the college till late night. All that stuff would happen. And I remember, you know, when we reached our last year, our friends, we started getting ready for campus recruitment. And we used to prepare for the, something called as lateral thinking problems. You know, these are problems that you have to think out of the box. Like these are not your regular math problem or something like that. You just have to think. They'll be so random. And when you hear the answer, you'll be like, what? Like that. I mean, I can throw a problem at you. I don't know if you will be able to guess that. <laughs> Do you uh, want me to give you a I'll, problem? I'll take a shot. Okay. If there's a carrot, calf, and five pieces of coal that are found lying on a lawn, and nobody put them on the lawn. But there is a simple logical reason that they're there. What could it be? Melted snowman. Yes, you're right. <laughs> you get the job. You passed it. <laughs> yeah, so we used, to, we used to prepare for these fun little things. And it was fun, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what does your first job end up being uh, after you pass the snowman test? <laughs> snowman <laughs> test. <laughs> so there were two companies came before I got my campus recruitment. So I didn't get into the first two companies, which I really felt bad for because, you know, you really want to be the first one getting the first job in the highest package. I got into a company called as Caritor Private Limited, which was a services-based company. That was my first job. And are you programming there? Or? Oh, yes. So that's where the actual transformation happened. That's where I learned my first coding language, that's .NET. So they put us in a classroom, kind of a boot camp where, you know, you're put in a room for one month and you're supposed to learn this new tech with a group of similar college folks who have joined. So that's where I learned .NET. And I remember it was an interesting experience because while you're learning, you're also getting observed and being picked for projects. That's how the process is, you know. Your job interview is not your last one. In this training where you're you know, getting selected for the kind of project you'll be put into. So I remember I got selected for a project for Mekison. So what sort of medicine type thing are you building with .NET? So that was my first healthcare project that I built was setting up maybe a small outsourced arm in Caritor, wherein uh, they wanted to train a team of eight developers on a proprietary app frame that they had. And we were supposed to be building apps to track people's past medical history, their allergy list, their medication list and all that stuff. So... I and one more guy from my group of interns who joined got selected for this project. And within a period of two years, this account grew from this team of eight members to 500, so which was a huge, huge win for Caritor. And personally, for me, it gave me a lot of opportunity to, you know, kind of lead the way because I was part of the core team. So I had to train up the next 500 developers to learn this proprietary AMP app framework and, you know, teach them the process of Mekasin. So I kind of grew very fast and got my first promotion within one, one and a half years there. You are listening to the Underserved Podcast. Underserved is produced by Maris Consulting Group, embracing the power of people in technology. For more information, visit MarisCG.com. That's M-A-R-I-S-C-G dot com. But then they were kind of trying to move you into a lead position. You said maybe not yet, huh? Yes. So as I said, I've been a competitive person. 
I have had the fighter spirit always. That kind of translated into leadership skill, I think, somewhere. And I got recognized for that, you know, taking charge of situation. So, yes, I was getting picked to be the lead for project lead kind of roles. But then I didn't want to be one project wonder, you know, just do one project, one domain, one technology. I wanted to really expand my technological breadth and learn something more, some more domain, some more tech. So I was like, hmm, this is time to move. When you're only out of school a couple of years and all of a sudden everyone's looking to you for leadership, you might want to scratch your chin and say, <laughs> maybe I should go somewhere where I can learn some more first. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because how could I just had one maybe maximum two years of experience. Like, I really didn't know that much to lead somebody, you know. Maybe I can, yeah, mentor some interns. I can mentor some freshers on this particular technology. But am I ready to do a scalable design? No, I don't think so. So what do you do instead? You move on? <laughs> yes. So I moved on to a company called Aditi Technologies, which is today called as Herman. It was a typical services-based company, you know, wherein you put together a team you pick a tech and learn it for two weeks and then you execute a project for three months, ship it and move on to the new technology. So I learned SharePoint, I learned Google SEO, SEM, meta search engines, financial domain, anything like search domains. I, I did so many projects in that two, three years of Aditi that I felt like, yes, enriched. Yeah, you mentioned on the pre-call you were doing like handling the financial side of employees, 401ks and stuff like that. I didn't know what 401k was at that time. Now I understand it much better and understand it. But yes, at that time, it was part of learning the domain, part of learning the technology. I remember we were building a project for a company where we had to handle their ESOPs, their 401k match and their deductibles and all that stuff. Yeah. Today, they make sense. Now, there was also a big flagship customer in Microsoft. What was it like working for them? Oh, wow. You've done your research. Wow. <laughs> I have forgotten those days. So we had like 100 plus developers who were working on Microsoft projects in Aditi. So they had a separate floor for these developers. And the reason for the separate floor was to be a certified Microsoft developer, you know, to get that komal.maliakalak.microsoft.com ID, you have to abide to certain, you know, rules and regulations. One of them was the bay that we sit at has to be really secure. There was no phones allowed. There was no memory drives. There was no external devices allowed. Like people used to have those iPods. Nothing was allowed. We had to listen to music like on a, radio or something like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Would they even tell you what you were working on? <laughs> I don't think so. There were security issues like, you know, if you are entering the bay and you leave the door open more than 20 seconds, there'll be alarms going on. And uh, from a code point of view, it was like, you'll get very specific requirements, you know, build this API, build this screen with this button and this UI and this logic. You would never know what it fits into from a bigger picture point of view. So I think that's how, you know, Microsoft makes different people build different pieces and then put it together. Uh, this sounds strangely a lot like a story a man told me he was alive during like world war ii and one of his friends was working on the atomic bomb oh my god and it was the same sort of thing they would put him in this top secret lab and tell him to make this tiny little actuator thing but not tell him what it was for could be i don't know maybe i built something like that i don't know but yeah yeah but it was interesting and that taught me how well-defined can requirements be you know you can really make any project that's splittable if you define your requirements clearly. You got married while you were there, right? Yes, that was the time I got married there. Yes, that's when life changed a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and the economy started uh, sputtering a little bit. Yes, I think recession hit that time and there was one day where I think half of the R&D services was let gone. Oh. It was a sad day in the office. You know, every time a manager walked towards you, you were like, oh my God, am I the next one? You know, you get an email and you're like, shucks, this is happening. So I was not part of that list, but the part that affected me the most in that whole proceeding was that in my team, my architect was gone, my tester one was gone, and my managers were gone. So it was just me and another UX designer who was left in the team. And we were clueless. Like, okay, we didn't make the cut, but now what do we do? Like, is our project still alive? Do we still continue working on our backlog? What happens? And that's when I realized the importance of communication and transparency in leadership because it took us around one month to get answer from our group manager to realize, okay, which project are we moving to? Are we in the same project or what's the way ahead? 
It's like purgatory. Like yeah. you're you weren't let go. You're still employed, but no one's telling you what to do, so you feel like you're going to get let go. Exactly. You feel like is there a next list coming because, you know. Ah, oh, that's tough. So from there you move on to work for EF Systems, EF Information Systems? Yes. That's the time I realized that okay, I enjoy the high of learning a new tech in this company, but I didn't see it as a company where I want to settle down. So I wanted to move to something else. And that time in the industry there was a lot of migrational projects that were happening. You know, you have a web-based project you want to convert into a Windows-based or you have a Windows-based convert into web. So Education First was a company that was hiring big time and it is into a unique business where they send students from china or non english speaking european countries to us to learn english and you stay with a host family you go to a couple of cities you tour around maybe learn a skill or two but the primary skill that you want to learn is english so this whole crm system was to manage those bookings you know your flights your stay your college your classes everything so that's that's what i worked on in ef Huh. I took a look at their website not too long ago and it looks like they're doing it in reverse too. So now like you can have your 10 to 14 year old like go over to Spain and just immerse themselves in Spanish or they yeah. they do it all the way up to adults now. Yeah, they do that. And if, I used to wonder like pay for this kind of a service, but then I know because when my husband traveled to China, he realized that language skill is very important, you know. There are these kids from really rich families who come and work in five star hotel just to meet expats because they want to get that experience to get that english speaking you know with the native influence. speaker yeah so people do that ha huh, interesting so what sort of technology are you working on while you're there so i think i was part of their project from web to windows and i was doing the transformation from web to windows so i was working on sql servers i was dotnet and you know a lot of performance enhancements a lot of data source connectivity all that but they were a privately held company and the folks that privately held them uh tended to be pretty strict so this is where i had my first child my elder son who's 13 year old today and i remember a, a incident when i came back after my maternity leave ef was uh, run by a swedish family and first day into office after my maternity leave i was given a high critical visible bug and i had to get this out that day itself kind of a deal and I had to stay in office late till 7 p.m. 8 p.m. and that was shocking to me. I didn't expect that kind of welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's a heck of a first day back. Yeah. Then I saw the tide in the company changing. They changed their policy where they went to this clocking system wherein you have to clock in your 9 to 5. Like even if you take a 1 hour lunch break then it becomes 9 to 6. If you take a coffee break then it becomes 9 to 6:15. And I was not used to that and I was like I've always worked in American companies where productivity matters what you produce what impact your code has matters not number of hours you spend in, on your desk and being a new mother that was really not working for me i was like okay time to find something else because i really saw a difference in how a policy at a company level can really drive women away you know because that wouldn't work for anybody mm. who wanted a life were they nicer to the swede expats <laughs> than they were to everyone else So interestingly we always had a Swede expat as office manager. Mm. Rules were different for them. There were areas of office which were no smoking for everybody else but they could smoke. <laughs> <laughs> There were rules that you could not have your coffee or your sandwich on your desk but they would have a buffet of food items on their desk. So yeah those are the kind of things you know it felt like I'm living a pre-independence era in India you know so I was like okay yeah, I can't work in this kind of environment I need to move. All right, enough of that. So where yeah. do you go next? I think after that I wanted to try a Fortune 500 company and I really wanted to feel the scale. So I went to Dell. That's where I went up. You feel the scale there? Oh yes, 100%. You know the kind of products that were getting built, the kind of volumes we were talking, the kind of use cases we were talking were not small anymore. It was really huge. You had to think through whatever you're building from that scale point of view. So yeah, that's something I enjoyed. <laughs> Searing has spent a lot of time and effort over the past 25 years building our reputation for quality and our brand. There was one big problem though. No one could pronounce our name correctly. Person on the street brand testing take 1. Hi, can you pronounce the name of this company? Searnix? That's a really good guess. Really? Now, how would you pronounce the name of this company? Searnix? Not even close. Can you pronounce the name of this company? Shrinks. 
Luckily for us, Syrinx was acquired in 2022 by the DeWinter Group. We're rebranding Syrinx under DeWinter's highly regarded technology consulting arm, Maris Consulting Group. We bring Syrinx's deep technology delivery experience, and they bring broader delivery capabilities and a new identity as Maris. Here's what you can count on from the unified Maris. We are now a nationwide powerhouse when it comes to technology consulting, from DevOps to developers, to project managers, to business systems. So join me in welcoming our future as Maris. Hopefully people will have an easier time pronouncing this one. How would you pronounce the name of this company? Maris. How would you pronounce the name of this company? Maurice. Is that your uncle's name? Can you pronounce the name of this company? Mars. That's a planet. Maybe not. So contact Maris today and we'll help you get your project done on time and on budget. You can call us at 408-297-7500 or you can find us on the web at MarisCG.com. That's M-A-R-I-S-C-G.com. Now that was around the time that like there was like a mobile device boom. Were you working on mobile devices? Yes, that was one of my primary reason. You know, every job change that I did was a calculated plan based on what was going on in the industry. And that was the time when mobile devices were really picking up. In fact, I remember I was put on a project which was for building this over the air updates for mobile phones, which are called Dell Street. Uh. So <laughs> imagine like an iPad size phone that you're using to talk to someone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, those were the days. <laughs> was it triangle shaped? No, it wasn't. <laughs> luckily, no, it wasn't. It was a square shaped one. I don't think that time we had versioned OSs for mobile devices. So firmware to OS version mapping was a challenge. And we had to really keep a algorithm to make sure that you're sending the right firmware upgrade to the right device because otherwise it's going to screw up the device. So I remember writing this algorithm with one of the developers, kind of patenting it and, you know, getting a lump sum amount after I left Dell for that. So, yeah, those oh, you, are the days. You got awarded a patent for that? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I had cool. A, yeah, Dell had a very interesting patent support team and they would really constantly advertise that and you know push for that innovative culture so i remember filing a patent for it and they review it and they help you polish it and it got selected finally so it was cool that's cool now things weren't always so smooth though you had a story about where testing on these <laughs> mobile devices got interrupted so obviously these devices were not available in india these were all devices that were export from us and they were expensive so I was the lead of the team, so I was in charge of managing them because we would do our testing on these devices regularly. One Friday, I lock up all these devices, big ones, heavy ones, in my pedestal and come back on Monday and I see that my pedestal has been robbed, you know. All the devices are gone. Oh. I was so scared because these were company property, this was expensive, implication on the project plan, we had a deadline coming up, how are we going to test? Because to get these devices in, it's not easy. Yeah, you got to clear customs. Oh, yeah, yeah. So many things, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's almost like, like, yeah, they're expensive devices that are hard to get in India, but now you've completely hosed the project plan, too. Exactly. That was the biggest challenge. And I've been dealing with devices even in my current job, and I know how tough it is to get them. If you have medical devices, I think I've learned about custom laws more after dealing with devices than before. So that's when I came up with this idea of, why do we need devices to test? Why can't we do simulations? Why can't we do automated test cases and, you know, really get rid of this dependency at that time? And it was more so to meet the deadline because we had something that was promised in the market. We are going to release this version and all this stuff. So I remember I got an award for that because I really, you know, handled the situation from a robbery to getting an innovative idea. Were you like taking images of devices and standing up virtualized ones or how would you test? There were different layers of testing. There was obviously layers of testing at an API level. Then there was unit testing. Then there were some simulators which were available already in Dell US, which teams here were using. Obviously, it was not at the level of really testing at the device because there can be some environmental challenges. But I think we could test at least 80% of our functionality. Better than zero. <laughs> 
always, always. <laughs> so you got back into the healthcare field after that, right? Yes. That's when we bought another house in a different part of the city and the commute became a challenge. And then I think I had to move because of that reason. Philips was again a big Fortune 500 kind of a company, big name in Bangalore city and they had unique policies. And that was the time when everybody was going into this platformization journeys, you know, everything was available as a service. Blah, blah, as a service. <laughs> yes. Code as service, infrastructure as service, everything was as service. And I remember the project that I got into was the platform layer, uh, data and infra layer for Philips, where we were building APIs for doing basic CRUD operations on DICOM images. And these DICOM images or these APIs can be used for anything. They can be used for X-rays, DXR, MMR, any of those big machines. But it was the same API that had to work for all of these different procedures or algorithms or all that stuff, which was a different kind of API development. Yeah, and you had to publish an ISO 9001 spec as well. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Philips, one thing I learned is the process. You know, it was, I think, 200 developers building code on the same repository. So you had to be really, really sure about your unit testing. And when you merge the code, if you break the pipeline, then you're fixing that code first before building your next story. So we had, I think, offices in Haifa and Bangalore. And you have to be really making sure because if you have a release, two days before that release, there is a test result a report that gets produced. And even if one test in that report fails, then the whole release gets pushed out by one week because you got to run it all over again and it is signed by the release manager. Those are all the part of processes as part of ISO 9001 certification. So you have to be really, really thorough in your coding practices. I got to imagine that managers lose their mind if they have to push it out by a week. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the part that got to me in Philips, I think. I did more code fixes than actual code. I was always working on like making sure the test is working, the test code is working, the test code is getting updated as per the new feature. So that kind of slowed down the whole process of release. You know, we would have one release in two years and it'll be like a big deal. Like next version of platform is coming. Yeah. Which was slow for me. Yeah, it's like turning a battleship. Yeah, it is. It is. But I understand why, because they have that huge dependency. Once your software gets baked into the device, then there's no way to patch or bug fix or something like that. Even if you could, like you'd have to get recertified by probably every three-letter acronym yes. that you can imagine. Yes. So what do you do after that? After that, <laughs> I wanted to try to get a, another job in a company which has a startup kind of feeling. If you know Bangalore, it's filled with startups you know there's a startup on every street though I like that high of being in a startup I didn't want to be worried for my paycheck by end of the month you know you put in your sweat and blood you work late nights and then if you don't get your paycheck then what's the worth of it so I was trying to find a company which I can get best of both when you start to look for a job you kind of do some preparational like a practice interview practice interviews. I'll just go do this one who cares <laughs> who cares yeah I'm not going to join this company I'm just going to do it for practice so Athena Health was the first company that I interviewed for after Philips and I didn't know the company it didn't even have a proper office they called us to a hotel and did the whole selection process in a day it was a recruitment drive and I was like yeah I got selected and you know like yeah fine but I'm not going to join this company it's fine and then I come back home, I tell my husband that I went to Athena Health and we do some research and then figure out, oh, it's a publicly traded company with $125 plus share price. And I'm like, oh, and they're setting up a new development center in Bangalore. They have a space in Chennai. And then I kind of started warming up. I did a reverse interview. I spoke to the person who hired me saying, okay, I want to talk to you once more and talk to you a little bit more about the role now that I know what you are. Now that I know that you're not a fly-by-night <laughs> operation, you're actually a big company, yeah. but with more of like starting a startup where I yes. am. Yes. That's cool. I think that's what fueled my growth also because I was part of the Bangalore office before I moved to the Watertown office in Athena Health. Bangalore office was part of acquisition, which was around 35 member. And by end of two years, we had grown that office to 300 member. Wow. We used to go to conferences like Grace Hopper, go to meetups and really, you know, spread the name for Athena in Bangalore. Chennai, Athena was known, but not in Bangalore. And Bangalore, it takes something to make your name because there's so many companies. Yeah, it's hard to stand out. Yes. Yes. So were you getting in back into devices again there? Yes. That's where I learned my custom law degree. <laughs> I was part of a project which was based on .NET. 
which was for all the devices that Athena Health integrates with, whether it's medical devices, your scanning devices, your printing devices, you know, your EKG machines, your vitals, all that stuff got integrated to Athena Health through this product for device integration. So yes, back to the same problem where how do you get EKG devices to India from US? How do you get medical devices to India? How do you get those check scanners and all the stuff? Uh, what happened on your first day? So that's the whole part, you know, why I've, I think I've still stayed in Athena is the first day I joined, we were shipping out MSIs for this product because this was locally installed in every practice user's machine to connect with the device because it has to speak to the native APIs. Our MSI was showing up as a virus on the user's machine. And I was like, oh my God, how is this possible? So is, does this mean there's a build server corruption? You know, is the CICD pipeline being corrupted? Is there, you know, some kind of infiltration? What's going on? And the other dev says, what build server? What CICD? <laughs> so I just build it on my laptop. I zip up an MSI and I ship it. That was the state at that time. <laughs> and that's what was part of the challenge that I enjoy, you know, transforming this project to a place where putting in all the engineering excellence concepts into it, making sure that it has all those logging, unit test cases, backward compatibility, scalability over the years because you can't do changes because these are locally installed. So you can't be shipping out MSIs every one month. People were not happy updating these MSIs and there were obviously stability issues. You know, it'll go break in a Windows 9, but what will work in Windows 7 or will not work in Windows 8.1. So we had to really be sure that whatever design that we were building, iteratively, it had to make sure that backward compatibility was maintained, all the environment issues were maintained. Yeah, uh, MSIs are tough, and you were not the only company that was just, you know, had some cowboys building them on their desktops <laughs> and shipping them out. <laughs> I remember a few times, like when I was at Monster, and then our first few clients after that, we were having to build MSIs, and people were like, oh, this can't be automated. I'm like, yes, it can. It needs to be rigorous and repeatable and testable and hands-off. If you have to do anything for this, if this is not scriptable, then it's not repeatable. I remember we had an interesting Google Chrome bug that was hanging over our project always like a sword because they were going to stop native API communication between a browser and a window service, which was running on the local system. And I remember how we transformed that MSI based project to a browser extension today. I really take pride in that project. You kind of start leading some more later in your career. You're ready to become a leader. So how does that happen? So this project that I'm referring about device integration was on an island of its own. It was .NET based, which is not the primary tech in Athena. So I realized that if I want to grow, I need to get onto the mainland and start picking up projects in the mainland. You know, I kept going back to my leaders and saying, hey, I want to pick up something more. Give me something more. And then I started officially taking the leadership role and got into an engineering manager role and started picking up other services that platform was building at that time. You know, your logging services, your identity services, your infrastructure as code services. So I bit the bullet as much as possible and went into the next challenge, next challenge. Yeah. Now you guys use a lot of Perl too, right? Yep. That's our monolith. That's what we're trying to convert to microservices and trying to cut vertical slices wherever it makes sense so that we can move away into this new tech. Now, up till now in your career, pretty much everything was in India. What made you decide to come to the States? So when I was in, in India, I was traveling a lot. And so was my husband. There were times when we were playing tag, you know, one month I'm here, next month he's here. And also, I think from my career expansion point of view, I felt that I needed to add this extra feather to my hat. Though I've worked with international teams before, you know, I have had teams in Malaysia, teams in US and UK, but I wanted to really work in US and see the difference. So we took a choice of moving during COVID between continents. So yeah. That's a gutsy choice. Oh, yes. I, that's my retirement plan. I'm going to write a book on <laughs> moving continents during COVID. We landed in 2021 when everything was shut down. But where'd you uh, live here in the States? So Brookline, Chestnut okay. Hill, that's where we started. But now we moved on to Northboro, a quite little town. It's nice out there. Yes, it More is. of a commute, though. Yeah. What did you find different upon kind of arriving in the United States? Were there kind of some culture shocks or people think differently? I think I was traveling here 
and i didn't feel that difference because when you come in on a business travel you book your uber stay in a hotel go to office pick up a lot of candy and go back home you don't have to worry about a lot of other stuff but then when you move to stay that's when you really see the real america i think one of the things that i realized lot of stuff is very plan driven very schedule driven you know you plan out your summer bookings right in january you book your summer camps 6 months before you know you book your appointments for everything you cannot just get up and walk in and say oh let's go you have to really plan your life and then that helped me understand my teams a little bit more because now i understood why communication played so much important role you know why i had to always forward feed my teams and let them know what's coming up what's the road map how we're going to handle this what's the plan for the future i think i got a little more insight after i lived here to understand okay why is it important to have that plan figured out are things more impromptu and like off the cuff in oh, india yeah. i mean i'm not talking about tech world but at least in life you know if you want to mm. go out to a restaurant you just get up take your car and drive in get a table there's no reservations Wh- whatever, and all that. whatever the wait is the wait is no <laughs> there are enough restaurants there are enough places to go it's just walk in there are no reservations there's no bookings you want to meet a doctor you walk into the place and just see the doctor <laughs> so i would say that i am guilty as charged as you were telling the story i'm like yeah we make our ferry reservations for july in january for <laughs> yes. our summer vacation yes. and my daughter's birthday is sunday night and you can bet i was on open table looking for a reservation oh <laughs> god <find> somewhere <laughs> Yep, yep. But now I've learned how it matters because a lot of anxiety that's taken out, you know. You know what you're doing this weekend. You know what's going to happen next month. You know, you plan accordingly. So it helps. It helps. It does re- remove some of that spontaneity though, and that yeah. could be kind of fun too. Yes, yeah. So what do you do when you're not hands on keyboard? As I said, I have two sons. One is 8 year old and another one is 13 year old. So they keep me busy a lot. the war of the remote control in my house is one you know there is no fighting it there are three boys and i so i have to watch spider man avengers all those uh, 2122 movie trivia is in my head useless knowledge that i'll never use but yeah it's there so they keep me busy but as i said i've recently moved into the country so our plan is to go to different places explore travel and eat different cuisines just experience the world where have you been in the us so far that was memorable So thanks to covid we couldn't do many far fetched things you know not too many flights but mm. i think we've covered mostly everything in uh, new england whatever is drivable so we've done the new hampshire we've done the white mountains the beaches and all the stuff we did do universal because i was going for a conference on my younger one's birthday to orlando and you can't do the parental crime of not going to universal <laughs> <laughs> so We did Universal last year, yeah. Especially if they're fans of all those comic book type oh, yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah. On his birthday, so. Yeah. I would have heard that all my life. <laughs> you made up for it. <laughs> well, if I can make a recommendation, if you can get to the Southwest sometime, like New Mexico and Arizona, it's mm. beautiful. Food's great, especially if you like spicy food. I got to go down there a lot when my family lived down there, so definitely check it out. I love spicy food for sure. With my daily to do, I have a list where whenever somebody says, "Oh, I went out for weekend," I was like, "Okay, where did you go? What did you do?" Like I have a list of places that we want to cover, so for sure I'll add Arizona to it. Nice. Any charities or causes that you're passionate about? So I've been always a uh, very diversity and inclusion kind of a person, you know, right from beginning of my career, I've always been involved in efforts. I feel for women it's a little tough to make mark, you know, there's so many times you're the only one in the room in a meeting room and then making your voice heard. So, yes, I accept there are some conditioning that has been done to our society and we have to fight the fight, but my goal is that I can make sure that at least the path that I'm leading becomes easier for folks that follow me. You know, how do I make sure that I leave a better world for them? So I've been always part of mentoring or you know just helping people, giving back or societies like Girls Who Code or you know there has been kids who want to study or want to learn about coding. So I always try to give back like that. So Komal, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experiences with the listeners of Underserved. Thank you so much Andrew for having me over. It was really a pleasure. I went down the memory lane and really relived those moments. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. And we'll talk to everyone soon on the next episode of Underserved. Thank you for listening to the Underserved podcast. 
For more information on the topics discussed and for show notes, visit the show website, underserved.fm. And please be sure to rate, like, and subscribe to Underserved on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.